Is everyone enjoying the ice cream? All right, one enthusiastic individual about ice cream. What about DataViz? Who here is pumped to, see, uh, to talk about DataViz right now? <laughs> Sweet. I mean, what gets us excited about data visualization? Maybe it's just interacting with the information. Visually querying uh, it, finally, I can see. You know, what about the tools? D3, right? It's, it's awesome and insanely popular. I mean, so much so that like, people are starting to say that D3 kind of rules everything around us. And people make some great, great visualizations. And you know, even better, some of them are interactive. Take this piece where I have to guess what the distribution of this data set looks like to get the information for, uh, and understand what's going on, drawing the individual in. It just, like a couple years ago, this just felt so new. Mike Bostock would create something and it looked like it's never been done before. Crossfilter is a great example. Like, I'm looking at a huge data set, updating a ton of distri different distributions in real time. But like, honestly, the reality though, this, this kind of stuff has ex uh, existed for a while. Like, data visualization has been an integral part of graphical user interfaces since the beginning. Um, and to prove it, uh, I've got a little excerpt from the mother of all demos, demoing the mouse uh, in 1968. So uh, there's no audio, um, but I'll just scrub through here. You can, you can see it's, this is the f one of the first, if not first, graphical user interfaces. And it's clearly got a node link diagram in it. Uh, he's talking about how this kind of representation helps people understand information in new ways. And like, if you look even further, this is the 1968 version of Google Maps. <laughs> like, this is, this is revolutionary, right? Back then, and even now, if uh, these kind of uh, interfaces just feel revolutionary. What, what, like why have we not made this uh, like this jump where like this is just normal for us. I think I have this theory that like really the web took us back several years in interfaces. Effectively like the best we could do was just render an image, spew that image from the server and put it in a div. So we went from this to something like this, ignoring the little gap. This it's extremely dense uh, and like looking at a ton of information. Also, at the same time, there's this term, big data, that came around. So while, while there were a bunch of diff different interesting things happening in, uh, in like visual, uh, data visualization, the venerated data scientists would just kind of showcase problems that we didn't know we had and solve them for us. And like these storytellers would create uh, a, a visualization that just made it completely obvious what's going on underneath. So by now you're like, who the heck is this guy? Um, well, my name is Miles McCrocklin, and I've been part of this community for a while. I've, organi I've helped organize SF data mining and Bay Area D3 user group uh, for the past couple of years. And uh, prior to that, I studied human-computer interaction and machine learning. Uh, and right now, I'm uh, working at Facebook, and I'm building data visualization uh, products leveraging data visualization and some just really great models. Uh, we're hiring, so if you're interested, come talk to me afterwards. <coughs> but that said, like before I jump into interaction design for data viz, let's let's define these things. What is data visualization? Well, like a business uh, person will say it's that chart, the button they press in Excel. Uh, a designer might just say it's a new medium for them to play, or, or like an artist might say it's a new medium for them to play in. Uh, a designer might say it's a way of uh, giving 
uh, tools for analysis so that users can take more actions. An engineer might say it's a way of like, increasing the amount of uh, information density that you can uh, give to one, a user in one single view. The root of this, though, like data visualization it is an integral part of communication. This whole a concept of mapping information to a visual plane. Like, we've been doing this for a while, again. Nature, like, we've, we try to understand uh, ourselves looking at nature uh, to even just making maps. It's one of the earliest forms of visualization. Like, think about it. If, if you had to understand what the world looks like just with your own uh, tools, what would you do? You'd walk. You couldn't even get through like most of San Francisco in your lifetime, let alone an entire continent. Uh, but when you ask people what, what the shape of the world looks like, what our continents look like, you see a distinct pattern in that data, like the distinct knowledge that these individuals have. So that said, like this visualization has existed, this type of visualization has existed for millennia. Here's one example from 600 BC. Um, the earliest proven one that I've heard of is around 4,000 BC. So what have we been doing for the past thousands of years visualizing information? Honestly, I have this theory that we're trying to boost our understanding of the world around us so that we can focus on new, uh, new problems that we didn't know existed. But I mean, recently, like 60 years ago or so, or longer, uh, we came up with this thing called a computer. So information or pictures could react to what we're doing. It, it's magic, right? And from it, it created this concept of a, of a field, this human computer interaction design, or uh, like user experience uh, interaction design in itself. Um, what, what do you think the goal of this field is? Does anyone have an example? Like, what are we trying to get at? You know, typically I hear from people that the goal for our, our, uh, a good user experience is for it to be simple. It has to be the simplest thing it poss can possibly be. And like, that's not a bad uh, way to think about things. Generally, it's a good, uh, good analogy. But the reality is, if, <laughs> if that's all the uh, user interfaces were, like, this would be everything that we do on the web. A nice big red button to do the thing. Or even better, there's no button. It just does the thing, and I don't have to think about it. That would just essentially mean we're kind of not needed, but the reality is there's always new problems for us to solve. And interaction design, it's, I like to think of it as like designing the dance between a user and information. So sometimes when you're choreographing this dance, you actually want it to be as simple as possible, making uh, the communication between an, a user and information that's, un, that's pretty well known, like text or images, uh, just fluid. But other times, you really want this, design, this dance to be like deeply uh, um, rooted in a lot of complicated movements and like getting to uh, have the user constantly go back and forth with, with the information that they're looking at. So again, it's not just about simplicity. Like, sim simple is important. Simple things should be simple, but complex things need to be possible, and they also need to be visible. So how do we design this? Like, what are, what are some of the things that we need to know in order to uh, go about this, kind of this task? Well, first, let's talk about, like, humans, what, what we're good at, what we, how we perceive the world. Uh, also, like, who is the audience you're trying to build for, and what uh, what the, the audience is really like needs from the information. So let's talk about uh, psychology. If you've ever taken a psych course, you probably know Weber's Law. Um, let's do a little experiment. All right, tell me which one's louder. No one? Okay, let's try this again. 
second one. All right. What about what about this time? Okay, I actually screwed that up. It's meant to be the same. Like the, there's roughly like the first the first one we did, there was really a barely a, a difference between the two. I'm sure it's there's some quantifiable amount, but we just can't easily perceive it. Weber's law formalizes that concept. Weber's law defines what's called the just noticeable difference for an individual. This applies in all areas of perception. That's, uh, we just did sound, but it also applies in, uh, in visualization. Uh, typography uses this a lot, uh, whether or not they formally define it. Um, and also, it's important to note that this really does vary from, user, er, from person to person. Like, uh, I might not hear as well as other people, or vice versa. And that's what K kind of stands for in this, in this uh, formula, but honestly, Ignore the formula. Like, how do, how do we apply this to visualization? Well, designers, um, either, even people in literature, have defined this like root of uh, of, visuals, uh, of our visual medium called visual channels. Um, it seems really obvious when you see them uh, laid out over here. You've got position. Like where the where an, uh, a piece of information is, the color of the uh, of the um, thing you're working on. Uh, we also have like common data types uh, like categorization, apple versus an orange, etc. Uh, so how how these visual channels represent information uh, like can be classified well can be classified leveraging Weber's law. So when uh, when you look at like area, you find that like quantitative information works really well, and also just like which one's larger. Um, this is this has been proven through uh, a lot of research uh, that like position is one of the best encodings for uh, for information, and hue works really well with categories, but not well with others. Um, so. How many, have you heard this before from a, a data viz professional? I hate pie charts or some derivative. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so do you know what, this is where this comes from. Like, take a look at these three distinct data sets, both with three different types of, uh, uh, both with three different types of, uh, or two, di two different visualizations. The pie charts are pretty similar. Like, yeah, I can notice that one in A is bigger than, or is smaller than C. Um, but it's it's much less obvious in the nuanced area so that like B looks like they're all the same data points But on a bar chart. I instantaneously see it By the way, this is on the Wikipedia article for pie charts, and I just like thank you for ever put that up there um, So Weber's law like it's used a lot and like research even recently, like Lane Harrison and his team at Tufts uh, tried doing this to analyze like the difference between uh, correlation, a more complicated task that you have to do in visualization, uh, deciding whether or not this uh, is negatively correlated or this is positively correlated. Uh, and they took a bunch of different chart types and uh, classified the, uh, the difference had people compare it and leverage Weber's law to validate that like a line, if it's if the data is just like slightly negatively correlated, you can barely tell. Um, but if it's on a scatter plot, it's pretty simple. Um, and they ended up creating like a rank of uh, what visualizations are good for what. Um, and I, I'd recommend reading this paper uh, because. This is, this is what uh, human-computer interaction uh, research is uh, using to classify and formalize uh, visualization. But what about, what about interaction, right? Like, with the web, we build UIs. Uh, there's this uh, law, Fitz law. It's the it's kind of, I like to think of it as the kerning for interaction de designers. Here's the formula. I'll explain it in a minute. Um, like, if you're familiar with kerning, kerning is for typography. Notice that C and E, the, the weird space. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm making you see bad everywhere, not just for typo, uh, not just for viz, but for 
uh, typography as well. So Fitz, Fitz Law is this concept that like just things are harder to click um, when you put them in just weird places. Like think about a close button just randomly smacked onto a page or uh, a link. Like this is an actual link and I can barely hover over it be because of uh, the fact that I have to like get within like a less than one pixel uh, width. So Fitz Law uh, like moves us in this direction of stuff that just makes more sense putting your close button uh, at the top uh, right corner, or top left corner, because no one's gonna miss it because there's a bounding box there, or just taking a, 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 like a link and turning it into a button, giving the user much more area. So as I said, there, there was that formula. So Fitz Law defines the time and error it takes for a user to go from one point, uh, the, where the cursor currently is to the desired uh, location on the page uh, by the size of the thing that they're trying to interact with and the distance that they have to go. So how do we apply this to visualization? Well, we've got, uh, like, take this example, a bar chart. Um, this one's designed by, uh, I for forgot their name, but, the, like, what is the common inter uh, way of interacting with a piece of information in a chart? Yeah, hovering, hovering over, or just inter like getting into the actual value on on the uh, that they're working with. The problem is in visualization, the the data dictates the size of the component. So I have to spend like an extra ton of time to get the value four uh, compared to ninety five. So you're you're naturally making people only care about the Pareto distribution or like sh the, t the top tier values, which is not, not always what you want the user to do. But if you, if you rethink the way that you're letting the individual interact with that piece of information, uh, like what is the goal when you're hovering over a value? Uh, a value? Does the Y uh, axis really matter for a bar chart? Generally, no. So if you just, create an invisible um, a rectangle that is the entire length in the Y dimension, the user can interact with every point much more easily. Just to prove that this works in, uh, like in action and people do implement things this way, this, there's this interesting bar chart uh, that again has hovering based off of uh, the position of the mouse. So a line chart is one of the most annoying experiences uh, that I see today. Like commonly, the user has to just interact with a one pixel line to get a piece of information, or maybe the, maybe the person's really nice and they put a little circle on top uh, so that uh, they can hover over that first. Um, but like following that same technique with the bar, if you just, what is, a, what is a line chart trying to do? It's trying to show the variation in y, the y dimension, by x. And x is typically time. So like, getting the, letting the user just get the piece of information at that one moment in time is much more simple by just removing that dimension of interactivity. So what about, scenarios where it just doesn't vary by, like there's no way to say, oh, this, this uh, one dimension is the one that I want to interact with. Like take the scatter plot. Every kid at some point in their life has made a scatter plot, drawn it out. Uh, it's pretty common, right? Um, yet, what, can you even see, oh, you can see these dots on the screen. I was a little worried about that. Um, but like I've got a two pixel, three pixel area that I have to hover over to get some detail. Like, that, that's just a very annoying experience. So how, how do we counteract this? Well, there's one technique like, that you can use, and it's called a Voronoi. Um, like, really what the goal of letting a user interact with a piece of information is you're trying to let them approximate their, 
the, the cursor's value to a point, uh, the nearest point on the plane. So a Voronoi defines this, um, and it's kind of a weird name and uh, needs a formal definition. So a Voronoi partitions an area uh, into cells based off an initial set of points called seeds. And a cell is a collection of points that are closest to a given seed. So you can think of your seeds as the points uh, in your scatter plot, and this area right here as being the set of points that are closest to that little yellow dot on the plane. So take away the magic, and you've got uh, a great way to interact with the pieces of information. Um, D3 automates this with you, uh, with like I think it's D3.layout.voronoi. Um, so quick implementation, uh, easy to easy to use. But personally, I I kind of feel like this is a little odd, right? Like my 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 uh, mouse is all the way over here, and I'm switching between Kuwait and uh, Equatorial Guinea um, by just moving, and I have no idea what's going on. Um, Thankfully, in 2005, somebody felt pretty similarly. They created this uh, thing called a bubble cursor. Um, and a bubble cursor is a way to replace uh, your, your mouse in a given uh, area on your, um, in your application. So what a bubble cursor is doing is it's showing you the distance from the nearest point, or like nearest available space, that you, uh, a piece of information you want to interact with from the cursor. Effectively, it's defining Fitt's law in real time to the nearest point on, uh, on the plane. So it, it, makes, it, uh, it makes it very intuitive for the user to just click. That said, aesthetics can kind of be applied to this and it can be de-emphasized a little bit better and uh, can work. Yeah, of course. Of course, you can't see it on the screen. Um, Designed for the medium that you're going to be uh, presenting on, uh, like using the visualization for, is a good note. Um, so, that said, all of these techniques can be layered and worked uh, across every visualization uh, that, that's out there. So, Andrew Couch created this great example, uh, which took a Voronoi as an overlay across a set of uh, a node link diagram increase the area of the thing that they're trying to interact with, make it much, much more touch friendly or something like that. Um, and it just, it feels a lot easier uh, to grab these points. So I'm gonna, uh, like we only really touched on like two aspects of uh, human computer interaction. There's really a ton more out there. Um, but honestly, like this only gets you but so far. You really, really have to know your audience like know the context that they're in, know what the what problems they're trying to solve. Like all too often, ignore uh, like I see just charts thrown onto a page, and it's like, oh, I did something really cool with visualization, uh, but all you did was go and ask people what they wanted, and give them a set of charts that they requested. Uh, so you're just staring, it, like they they stare at the information. They're like, oh, cool, that's exactly what I thought I'd see. All right, I'm done. Um, and again, this doesn't have to look ugly uh, to fall into that same category. This visualization uh, looks very aesthetically pleasing. Uh, may even have a good, a good couple uh, things about it, the interac uh, interaction design, uh, but it has no idea about the data that's underlying. So you can talk to your users directly, do user studies, um, get personas to help your team ground, uh, like get grounded on what they're building, uh, do A-B testing. But honestly, like I'm not gonna cover this stuff because conferences and other talks today uh, are really gonna be focused on this. Like this is, uh, uh, like most, I think most of us in the room are, are developers. The reality is like just because you do development and somebody else is a PM or a designer doesn't mean that you're excluded from knowing this information, you really should uh, care about who your audience is and who you're building for in order to create great products. <laughs> so again, who is this for? You are never the user. Uh, ask your customers questions. 
or if you're doing data journalism, they're your readers. So I mean, take this example. Uh, the context that the, uh, the user is coming in with, it's the 2012 elections. So it's between Romney and Obama. Yeah, there's a ton of other people, but why, why do they, uh, users need to know that? It's in the US. They always know it's the re uh, Republican versus Democrat. So cut all that out. And then uh, like understand what, what kind of information they want to gain. They want to know who's going to win, what, what's the likelihood that these people are going to win. And just to prove that some of the interactions design principles, like, um, or human-computer interaction things, like Fitz Law, are really important. They, re they made it very easy to interact with any aspect of this chart. Um, but more importantly, they knew what kind of questions people were going to have as soon as they saw the information. They knew the first thing is like, well, what's going to happen if Florida wins the Republican vote? Oh, that changed quite a bit. <laughs> um, what happens now? Oh, oh, Obama wins. Um, so like, this, this is a great example of knowing what the users need and want from the information uh, behind it. Expository visualizations like this, they're really fortunate, right? I mean, they, they know what the data set looks like. It's completely static. Um, and they're, they're exploring the data themselves to find, find that aha moment or make them uh, like, uh, understand what's going on. So like, they, they have a bit of an advantage and like, they can just take the user through this beautiful story um, about, uh, 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 like, through a huge data set. But at the same time, like, Visualization is used in a lot of other places. I mean, most, most people don't think about Airbnb as having a visualization in it, but look at this from the lens of a data visualization person, uh, individual. There's a map, a huge map, again, visualization. You, uh, you've got a distribution of the price ranges. You've got common filters. I mean, this is, this is, kind, this is common stuff. Um, in data visualization, but it's also pretty common in products. Uh, and this is really, really well designed. Like, they, they knew exactly the first two questions everyone's gonna ask. Where the heck am I uh, sleeping tonight, and what, what does the bed look like? Like, uh, and they really tailored the experience for that, constantly reiterating to the user the price as they're figuring out that problem. Yeah, they've got, they have these, these other uh, more advanced features, um, and they're really important, but, uh, but de-emphasizing them is also key. So again, let's pull this back and apply it to something that most people consider is data viz. It's a block from Mike Bostock, it has to be. Um, so this is a, a, a scatter plot, right? We, look, we looked at a scatter plot, talked about Fitz Law, talked about interacting with one point. So you're gonna put a, like maybe 300, 500, 1,000 points on a plane and the goal for the user that you're setting out for them is to interact with every piece or interact with certain pieces of it. Honestly, I think you should ask the question of like, how does, how does this two dimensions relate to other, these other two dimensions? And by doing that, you end up creating a way of the emphasis, or like following Fitz Law uh, like ask, uh, answering different questions about this data set that the user couldn't have answered if they, all they were given was just a way to interact with one point. So to wrap up, we talked about uh, some HDI principles. We said how audiences are extremely important and knowing the use cases or what they need from this information is uh, like, first and foremost. But before I go, I just want to say, like, no one to break the rules. Just because one person says pie charts suck doesn't mean you have to, uh, you, you, uh, you have to follow it. Like, I really hope to see a web where we can just take this chart from that div we put it in because of images and explode it and think of the new ways to interact with information. So.
Thank you. Uh, questions? Are you talking about this? Or the, oh yeah, the interaction. Okay. Um, well, first I want to mention that like um, the Voronoi, you can kind of really custom tailor it if uh, um, and do some complicated math where you actually take a set of points and build a Voronoi based off of the set of seeds. Um, that'd be a lot of custom code. Um, so that's possible, and that set of points would be along the the line that you were talking about. Um, but that said, uh, back to this visualization, uh, interactivity happens, assuming, yeah, there we go. Uh, they, they take that chart and then bound it, uh, which is a great uh, uh, way if you know Gestalt's principles, um, to like focus the user uh, in only when necessary, only when hovering over the, the line that they wanted to interact with. So, and it's, it's kind of a derived uh, interaction. I mean, it's a hard problem. I couldn't imagine uh, how they <laughs> iterated on this one, but yeah. Um, yeah. Well, um, that's a really good question. Uh, like, it's uh, yeah. So the question was, how how do you know when you have just too much information on the page? Um, I kind of I haven't formalized it, but it falls into that whole like you know it when you see it. Uh, problem. I think this one just toes the line really well, and it, like again, it takes the user through a story, um, but then once you get all the way down, uh, gets the user, uh, bounds the user into the boxes. Again, that's a useful technique. It's I'm not invalidating it. I just, it's uh, it needs to, uh, like we need to rethink the way that we, uh, like that's uh, that as being the only way to do data visualization. Um, it's a really fine balance. So. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. Um, so I mean, that's a little bit out. I mean, that's a really, really great question. Uh, I mean, if you f are familiar with a uh, blog called Flowing Data, they have a ton of examples from a bunch of different uh, vi visualizations, and they sometimes are like, "This is completely unethical." They're actually com misrepresenting the information. Say, just com completely changing the scale for one data point. Um, I, I don't typically do that, and um, I would say like when it comes to the ethics of visualization, representing the the data in in the best form possible is really important. So, sure. Uh, let's see. If, well, that just ruined everything. Um, <laughs> so there's a there's a couple other principles. So one of them is called change blindness. So as I'm going over here, and you're seeing like this weird, uh, like flash. Of a new uh, a new slide, you have to do a visual diff. Like your brain is actually diffing between the two images. So there's certain scenarios where you want to do a nice transition uh, between two points um, or between two states of your application. It's honestly one of the things that like when you hear uh, front end developers get really excited about full page web apps, like they're really talking on like, oh great, I don't have to design, or like the transitions are inherently a heck of a lot better um, and like people, the experience is better. Whether or not we communicate it that way, that's really uh, what we're giving users by doing a full page web app. Um, then the Gestalt principles, so let's see if the internet works. Um, so Elijah Meeks, who gave a um, uh, a talk on or like a workshop earlier, talks about like this concept of similarity, or it like goes over the Gestalt principles, and these are just a couple of them. One is similarity, which is like naturally your brain just assumes that red, uh, the red are matched together. You're seeing an actual like three uh, like vertical lines not horizontal lines because of the similarity between the two points uh, proximity again like just by separating them out you naturally say this is one group this is another um, and then the concept of enclosure like putting charts inside of a div can be important because you're bounding those two sets of data so um, there's there's others uh, as well uh, the rule of thirds is pretty common in uh, photography and other aspects. Um, you want to follow what's called the golden ratio. Um, but yeah, there's a ton. If you want to ask more, uh, come talk to me later. So. 
Thank you.